Hello, thank you for joining me. Today I'm going to present on the management of acute carbon monoxide poisoning with CPAP therapy as a viable alternative to conventional oxygen therapy and hyperbaric therapy in rural emergency departments. To begin, some background information. When carbon monoxide mixes with hemoglobin in the blood, it forms carboxyhemoglobin, a hemoglobin degradation byproduct found in low concentration in our blood naturally. A typical carboxyhemoglobin baseline measured in a population who are not exposed to any extrinsic carbon monoxide is about 1 to 3% in non smokers and 5 to 10% in those who do smoke. The consequences of elevated carboxyhemoglobin levels range from a headache when carboxyhemoglobin reaches 20% to syncope at 40% and can become fatal when carboxyhemoglobin reaches 80% in the blood. This warrants the need for conclusive evidence on how to manage exposure effectively. Through analysis of randomized control trials and a systematic review, this presentation will argue that continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP therapy, is a superior intervention compared to conventional oxygen therapy and hyperbaric therapy for the management of adult patients with carbon monoxide poisoning in rural emergency departments. Furthermore, I would like to stress that the implementation of CPAP for treatment of carbon monoxide poisoning is an emerging and promising advancement in healthcare that respiratory therapists should be conscious of and advocate for continued research in. Now I'll speak about some of the effects of carbon monoxide. In the bloodstream, carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin with 210 times greater affinity than oxygen. The binding of carbon monoxide to one of the four tetramer Hemoglobin sites increase the affinity of oxygen to bind and remain bound to hemoglobin. This forms carboxyhemoglobin and causes a left shift in the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. The effect of this shift is that there is a decrease in oxygen delivery to the tissues and histotoxic hypoxia. Generally, a toxicity grade is assigned on admission to the hospital and is correlated to signs and symptoms. It has been identified that while symptoms are indicative of carbon monoxide poisoning, they are not necessarily reliable indicators of the percent carboxyhemoglobin. Patients with low but elevated levels of carboxyhemoglobin show clinical manifestations that actually closely resemble influenza. Therefore, it's much more reliable to objectively measure the carboxyhemoglobin via co-oximetry or arterial blood gas, which are able to differentiate dyshemoglobins unlike spectral photometry alone. Respiratory therapists should be aware of exposure signs in the emergency room in order to properly provide appropriate care for their patients. One of our first effects. Carbon monoxide poisoning may present as a metabolic acidosis, grand glass appearance on chest x-ray, and carboxyhemoglobin levels that are greater than 25% with a PaO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury. A second effect is that prolonged carbon monoxide exposure can lead to further respiratory complications, including pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and ARDS. As well, multiple systems in the body are affected by this alteration. Acute hypoxic injury occurs in especially highly perfused organs, such as the heart, as well as the brain. Cerebral white matter experiences inflammatory changes, demyelination edema, and focal necrosis when the brain undergoes reperfusion and is exposed to radicals produced from highly oxygenated blood. The combination of these adverse consequences often leads to chronic, cognitive, sensory, and motor deficits, termed neurological sequelae, and can cause uncontrollable emotional alterations and seizures. So why is this important to us? Let's discuss about carbon monoxide in Canada. The prevalence of carbon monoxide poisoning continues to be problematic and the outcomes are often severe, if not deadly, without early intervention. Statistics Canada reports carbon monoxide poisoning was responsible for 3,027 hospital admissions between 2002 and 2016 in Canada, as well as 4,990 accidental carbon monoxide poisoning deaths in Canada between 2000 and 2016 in which one third were found to have no other underlying causes of death. And perhaps even more frighteningly, there has been no decline in hospitalizations in the past 18 years in Canada, despite the widespread implementation of carbon monoxide detectors. Hospitals continue to treat about four to 500 carbon monoxide poisoning patients per year since 2002. 
Now we'll discuss the standard therapy. The current practice followed in emergency rooms is 100% oxygen via a non read mask when the flow is set to about 10 to 15 liters of oxygen per minute. Immediacy in diagnosing and treating is imperative as mortality declines from 30% to 10% when supplemental oxygen is received within the first six hours. Using supplemental oxygen increases the partial pressure of oxygen in the artery, shifts the oxygen hemoglobin curve to the right, and this competes with and binds carbon monoxide, clearing it from the blood during the exhalation. When a non rebreathing mask is used, the half-life of carbon hemoglobin is reduced from about four to five hours all the way down to two hours. The loose spinning seal of the mask on a non rebreathe is capable of delivering about 70% oxygen when flow is set to 50 liters per minute. On the other hand, CPAP masks, which have a tight fit, provide a much higher FiO2 than the reservoir mask. This is believed to be much closer to around 100% FiO2. Now we'll discuss how CPAP aids in carbon monoxide clearance from the blood. The airways are stented open throughout the breath as a result of this constant positive airway pressure and alveolar collapse at end exhalation as minimized. This optimizes lung diffusion and gas exchange area. The effect of this is that oxygenation becomes more efficient at any given FiO2 and that tissues can be more rapidly supplied with oxygen. The level of CPAP can be easily manipulated by the user and can cause dramatic improvement in oxygenation over a short period of time. This allows for oxygenated hemoglobin to be more effectively compete with carboxyhemoglobin at the binding site. So let's talk about our effect plan. One of the many indications for CPAP is refractory hypoxemia, which is when the PaO2 cannot be maintained at greater than 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury with an FiO2 of 50% or greater. This is one of the very most common symptoms in carbon monoxide poisoning. Secondly, during carbon monoxide exposure, direct insult to the pulmonary vasculature occurs causing elevated hydrostatic pressure and fluid accumulation in the interstitial space. This is known as cardiogenic pulmonary edema and leads to a reduction in FRC. Current recommendations are a CPAP of 8 to 12 centimeters of water to improve FRC and most effectively treat cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And thirdly, CPAP has the added capability to effectively decrease the sensation of dyspnea that is often experienced in carbon monoxide poisoning and one of the most prevalently reported symptoms. Now I would like to move on to the data, where here I present two case studies. The first case study I would like you to focus on is the blue line. The blue line is a case study conducted by IDLE. Two patients were exposed to carbon monoxide in the home while asleep. One had a carboxyhemoglobin measuring 24% and the other 26%. One received non rebreathe therapy and the other CPAP therapy. The carboxyhemoglobin levels were measured using arterial blood gas analysis every 30 minutes. The concentration of carboxyhemoglobin dropped to 5% in 5 hours for the patient with non rebreathe and within 2 hours for the patient with CPAP. The same result was achieved, but three hours quicker for the patient who received CPAP therapy. Neither patient reported a history of smoking nor underlying pathology that could alter the results. IDLE established that the subjects had no erroneous factors that could impact the reliability of the study. So, as I can see there, the blue line is IDLE study. The solid line represents CPAP. The dashed line represents non rebreed both patients began with a carboxyhemoglobin level around the same percentage. However, the patient receiving CPAP cleared the carbon monoxide from the blood much faster than the patient receiving non rebreathe Now I would like you to focus on the purple lines. In a study with similar structure by Roth, carboxyhemoglobin levels fell from 21% to 3% in 120 minutes using CPAP and took three times longer, 360 minutes, for the patient treated using non-rebreathe. All conditions were kept constant with the only variable being the therapy received, which resulted in recovery within one third of the time using the CPAP therapy. As you can see here in our graph, the solid line represents CPAP and both studies, the CPAP therapy had very similar results. Now, if we look at the dashed lines, the non-rebreathe therapy, 
Both of those studies show very similar results once again. And a third study, a larger experimental study, was collected by Dalview using swine exposed to carbon monoxide as the test population. Once the carboxyhemoglobin levels reached 30%, CPAP and non relief therapy were initiated. They used a carotid artery catheter to gain ABG samples and collected them in preset time intervals. The results revealed that carboxyhemoglobin half-life was reached in 58 minutes for the the swine who received CPAP therapy, and 85 minutes for the swine who received non rebreed While this experiment offered a much larger, more reliable population size compared to the first two, the study was conducted on swine, which have a relative affinity for carbon monoxide only 130 times greater than oxygen. Hence why I did not include them in our graph image here as to not sway any of the visualization. Now I would like to discuss hyperbaric therapy. While hyperbaric therapy is undeniably effective in eliminating carbon monoxide from the blood, it is not widely available, which is problematic in that it delays therapy, prolongs recovery time, and increases the likelihood of long-term consequences. The purchase and operating costs are other considerable downfalls of hyperbaric therapy that make it impractical solution for all patients. There are only three licensed hyperbaric therapies facilities in Alberta, and only two are in the hospital, Foothills Medical Center and the Sequoia Hospital. This means that only cities with greater than 800,000 people and the closely surrounding areas have access to hyperbaric therapy. This excludes a major portion of the population, which for this paper states as being a rural for ease of distinguishing. The cost to offer each chamber is approximately 190,000 per year without additional physician billing, and were purchased in 1995 for $111,000 each. Hyperbaric therapy itself presents adverse effects that are not specific to any one condition. These include, but of course are not limited to, claustrophobia, inner ear damage, sinus damage, decreased cardiac output, and fire risk. And it has actually been found that they can aggravate existing conditions, including diabetes and epilepsy. In a case study by Arblu, CPAP mass ventilation was used on a patient with 42% carboxyhemoglobin and a GCS of 8. Due to the severity of the patient's symptoms, which included nausea, headache, dizziness, among many other, hyperbaric therapy was considered. However, it was disregarded as this would have required the patient to be transferred to another facility, which was not feasible due to the patient's instability. It is understood that hyperbaric therapy should be considered and initiated within six hours to have any possibility at reversing the neurological deficits and cardiac ischemia caused by carbon monoxide poisoning. Lack of accessibility, additional costs, and transporting critically ill patients are detrimental factors that make hyperbaric therapy less desirable in rural settings. Now, finally, to conclude, I would like to state that the rudimentary emerging evidence here is promising and is in favor of using CPAP therapy with a 100% option over traditional non rebreed mask in terms of reducing the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin at a much faster rate. Patients who are considered for high hyperbaric therapy are often unable to receive this therapy within a feasible amount of time in an emergency setting. Furthermore, transporting these unstable patients to larger centers without hyperbaric therapy possesses its additional risks. The implementation of CPAP for carbon monoxide poisoning is immense because it reverses the causative mechanism, it treats the signs, and it has the ability to relieve the symptoms. I would like to finish by discussing some limitations and future research. Future research with larger sample size would be beneficial in order for the data to be accurately generalized and reliably applied as protocol for a greater population. It would also be of value to study the use of bi-level positive air pressure, BiPAP, to optimize ventilation and further aid in relieving the high work of breathing associated with carbon monoxide toxicity. The arguments presented in this paper emphasize that the use of CPAP for carbon monoxide poisoning has great potential and warrants further exploration. I've also included here some of my references for your viewing. Excellent. And if you have any further questions, please let me know. I hope this a presentation has shown you that CPAP has great potential and that respiratory therapists should be always aware of other alternatives for carbon monoxide therapy treatment.